Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, David. Um, I have to say, um, like Roger, I, I also have a book coming out. I was here at the museum last week giving a book talk, and uh, it was in a smaller room, and it wasn't quite this full. I think only Warren Buffett can fill a room without even being in it. Uh, it's very impressive. I was speaking with someone who came all the way from London to be here today. So um, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks to the Museum of American Finance for sponsoring this event in this glorious historical space. And um, this panel is about the shareholders' perspective on Berkshire and, and Buffett's contributions. So I won't introduce the panelists at length because you all know who they are, and if you don't, you don't belong in this room. Uh, but uh, to my far left, and these orientations have nothing to do with politics, is uh, Tom Russo. Uh, Tom has a long storied career in, in value investing, and he's a managing member at Gardner Russo and Gardner in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I think he came here by Amish horse and buggy, but he got here on time. Uh, to my immediate left is Paul Lounces. Paul uh, is with Lounces Asset Management. He's a former employee of the Sequoia Fund, also worked at Royce, uh, and knows Berkshire very, very well. And to my right is Whitney Tilson. I'm fresh from the New York Marathon. And uh, congratulations, Whitney. And um, Whitney is perhaps best known as being an incredible uh, proselytizer for value investing. And I'm sure 150% of the people in this room are on his great email list, which has done great work for um, trying to inoculate people with the value gene. So the first question I wanted to ask each of my panelists is, uh, why do you own Berkshire? What's, what's the point? And Whitney, uh, maybe we'll start with you um, and uh, the slide presentation that we see immediately behind us that you're going to tell us about. Right. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the slide presentation, but um, um, uh, so I've owned Berkshire for a little over 20 years, including the full 17 years I've been managing money professionally. It's the only stock I've owned since inception ranging in size from a 3% position to a 30% position. Um, today it's about a 5.5% position in my fund, and I've been adding to it recently um, at today's prices. Uh, I own it because it has everything I look for in a stock, sort of a foundational blue chip stock uh, in my portfolio, uh, safe, cheap, and uh, has decent growth. Uh, so uh, very briefly, um, the stock's around 200. I peg intrinsic value. I just updated my model um, uh, on Friday after the company re uh, reported earnings. Uh, I peg intrinsic value at $267,000 per A share, you know, plus or minus 10%. Reasonable people can disagree with some of the assumptions. Uh, but very simply, um, I take investments per share uh, and value that at investments per share. At, uh, um, at the beginning of this year, uh, it's, only, uh, it's only disclosed once a year, so I, I just add a few percent from the uh, beginning of the year number, so that was $140,000 per A share. Uh, then I put a 10 multiple on pre-tax earnings of about $11,500 per share, uh, and that gets you to about $255. Um, I estimate that intrinsic value's gone up probably 3% so far this year based on 2.7% increase, or 3.3% increase in book value, 2.7% increase in operating income, excluding investment income this year, uh, which I think is pretty conservative. And then I think um, they have not fully realized the value of the, of the enormous profit Berkshire has made in Kraft Heinz, which is uh, another 4,700 bucks a share, and that gets you to 267. So the math is laid out, I think, on slide 15 of my presentation, which I believe is, uh, I provided it to the folks here, and so it's on the website here. Um, uh, and you can find it on the internet. If you just Google probably Whitney Tilson Berkshire presentation, you'll find a link to it immediately. So, so it's a 75 cent dollar today. Um, and I think that's reasonably conservative, uh, 75 cent dollar. And six years into a bull market, I'm not finding a lot of safe 75 cent dollars out there that still have decent growth and run by the world's greatest investor. So that's why it's uh, probably my third largest position in my fund right now. 
Tom, I think you wanted to talk about this from the perspective of a uh, presentation that uh, Warren Buffett made many years ago. Yeah, that was a, that was a, a wonderful uh, write-up that he submitted to a, a journal of finance where he described why Geico was attractive to him in 1950. The um, <laughs> business had a million, no, it had 150,000 insured at the time, up from 35,000 over the prior, prior 15 years, and he thought it could really grow. Um, I'm sure he would have been, um, uh, he probably would not have thought it could get to 11 million, which is where it is today, but he certainly was forward looking. And actually, the story that, that Jason refers to is that it, um, it showed the first, some of the earliest steps where Berkshire was moving from a margin of safety being based on price only to the business franchise. And so Geico possessed inherent competitive advantage, and Warren found that to be very attractive. Um, um, uh, I wanted to just start by, by making one observation, though. <clears throat> I'm surprised that we had to have a formal apology about the temperature in here. We are value investors, after all. We're supposed to know how to suffer. Um, we, have the, <laughs> we, have, we have the endurance. We can hold on to positions for a long time. And just because it's a little bit chilly doesn't mean that we aren't uh, going to plow forward. So I, I thank you for that, but I don't think it was necessary. No. So let me ask you the other question, which is, why, why own Berkshire? It's, it's a, my largest holding. It's been so for decades. Um, I've never sold it. There's just this extraordinary alignment of interest, and there's an, almost no agency costs. And those are the things that uh, you really have to get right if you're going to own a position in a business that can compound for a very long period of time. And I can't think of a better way to eliminate agency costs than to um, invest with a man who owns, I know, 30% of the company gets paid $100,000 a year. And um, inside the business, what he does is very tax efficient. Um, uh, um, uh, Bill was questioning whether or not it was wise to go into the corporate form. Warren celebrates the fact that within the corporate form, he can move capital around and fund those businesses that are most promising. And, and, and that's extremely valuable and it's proved so over a very long period of time. Um, I would own it because of the, uh, the, the Warren's willingness to do anything. He, he can find rabbits out of any kind of hat. Um, but more importantly, because of his capacity to do absolutely nothing for as long as it takes to come up with the right idea. And that's so undervalued in, in the world where people find that they have to do something just because they're expected to. And at Berkshire, nothing is, is a very good outcome in the insurance business when they don't underwrite, in the investment business when they build cash. Um, I think after Warren uh, moves from the stage, the firm's culture, the, the, the promise that it extends uh, to businesses that they would like to own that that's the place that businesses like that should go, I think will remain intact. And that means just um, allow the managers to continue to manage the business and, and do so in a, in a protected environment, I think is an appealing uh, aspect and will continue to draw like-minded folks to Berkshire. And uh, when anybody here has uh, any fear over Warren's ongoing uh, skill or commitment or, or ability to play the hand that he's dealt, I'm reminded of a call I had about three months ago, um, and it was from a friend of mine who lives in Omaha, and he called just to let me know that he had been to lunch, and he, he went to Piccolo's or someplace, and sitting next to him was Warren, eating alone, and he had just, that day, written a check for $37.5 billion, and he was comfortably eating by himself with no distraction. In New York City, when you sign a monthly contract with a uh, parking garage, you go out to Delmonico's and have a signing uh, lunch. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing where it's just, you know, he's, he's at the point where he is today writing $37 billion checks without um, b b b blinking because it's, it's accumulation of all the checks he's written up until now. And, and he has the confidence that he's done the right thing. Yeah. So those are the reasons. Paul, um, Berkshire, I think, is also your largest position, correct? It is. So what do you, what do you tell clients who say, why am I paying you your management fee just to put my money in something I could, I could buy without any agency costs at all? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, Berkshire's our largest holding since the inception of the firm 14 years ago. And we run primarily balanced accounts, um, separate accounts. And it represents probably 20% to 25% of the equity component. And the reason I would say that is, first of all, We've been enormously fortunate, and they've done exceedingly well. Secondly, part of what you're paying us for is to understand the company broadly and more deeply than a typical investor could. 
And in studying Berkshire, we think there's enormous embedded value there with a great deal of optionality. Um, it's a unique culture that permeates the organization, and it really stems from Warren himself. It's Warren-centric, like Seth was, was saying earlier. And one of the things that really jumps out at me is the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, every institution is the length and shadow of one man. And that really defines Berkshire. The other thing is I've continued to gain comfort in owning it over the years because of the way he's transformed the firm into an incredibly solid, stable, predictable, growing operation. We talked about initially about the net nets and then how he evolved into the better businesses, buying the Post in 73, 74, and then Geico sees Candy in 72. And then he evolved into buying entire businesses. And in the early 80s, the value was really his tremendous mind in buying many of these public companies. Today, I feel really good knowing that even if something happens to him, which would certainly be devastating, you've got Burlington Northern, Iskar, many of these private companies that will continue to do well uh, even when he's gone. So we think there's enormous embedded value in Berkshire. We think part of what we're being compensated for is really understanding it now and into the future. And I think a couple years ago I, I dedicated seven pages to what's going to happen to Berkshire um, or our view of Berkshire after Mr. Buffett's gone. And we don't anticipate selling it then either. Um, the things that are on the books, whether it's Geico at two and a half or three billion, Geico's worth 10 to 20 times that, 10 to 15 times that. There's enormous embedded value there, and there's a lot of other things that they'll be able to do to realize value when he's gone. They could choose to pay a dividend, I'm not saying they will, but there's a lot of things they'll be able to do. And then also with regard to what Tom said, the optionality issue, they have the capacity to do deals of almost any size and the privilege of doing nothing, which gets back to what Seth talked. That permanent capital is something that gives me enormous confidence in with regard to Berkshire. And he doesn't have to swing unless it meets his criteria. And that's one of the enormous benefits that Berkshire has. Mm -hmm.